My name is Paul Gilman, and I have uh, my co colleague Ty Nices here with me, and um, also other colleagues on the SAM team. So this is the first in uh, this year's series of SAM webinars. Uh, tomorrow, my colleague Mike Wagner will be talking about molten salt power tower models. Um, so you're welcome to register for that one. And then we're offering uh, basically another webinar every month uh, after that for the rest of the summer. Uh, we record these webinars and post uh, recordings on the SAM website. You can find recordings of past webinars on the same page that you use to uh, register. Um, so you'll find a recording and, and associated materials for this webinar probably in the next couple of days on, on the, the SAM website. Um, and I should mention that we are recording this session. Um, <clears throat> All right, so um, here's what we're going to talk about today. We'll uh, start with what's new for CSP in the latest version of SAM. And then I'll go over uh, industrial process heat applications, give us some context uh, for the new IPH models. And I'll discuss a new economic metric that we've uh, developed for the models. And then I'll, I'll uh, sort of do a quick demo uh, in each model in SAM itself and hopefully leave uh, 15, 20 minutes or so at the end for questions and answers. Um, and if you do have a question as I'm speaking, uh, please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar widget there and type your question there. Um, we'll either try to address it uh, directly by typing in the, an answer in to your question, uh, or we'll uh, wait to, to the end of the to the Q&A session to address it then. Um, so please use the questions box to, uh, to communicate with us. All right, so what's uh, new in CSP uh, with the latest version of SAM? Um, there are two changes on the CSP side of things, uh, or two broad changes. Uh, for the CSP generic model, <clears throat> we've changed the regression equations uh, for some of the model calculations. So if you've been using that model uh, in older versions of SAM, you need to be aware that you'll need to recalculate your coefficients for those, um, those equations. Um, there's information about that in the documentation, and um, as always, you can contact us if you need help with, with that conversion. Um, and on the power tower model, uh, we've made some improvements to the um, dispatch and solar field optimization al algorithms. And uh, Mike will be going into those in, in more detail tomorrow, so you can learn about that then. Um, and then we've added the, the solar industrial process heat models that I'm discussing today. A quick note on terminology. Um, I'm going to use CSP to refer to, um, or concentrating solar power to re refer to uh, electricity generation projects, and solar industrial process heat, or just IPH for short for process heat applications. Um, so the CSP systems and IPH systems both use concentrating collectors to convert solar energy into heat. And the CSP systems typically operate at higher temperatures and uh, deliver that heat to a power cycle that, that runs a steam-powered turbine uh, for electricity generation. And the process heat, which are typically at lower uh, temperatures, delivers the heat to some, some industrial process. Um, here's a graph that I uh, got from the EPA website that shows kind of the range of industrial process heat applications um, and different technologies and shows uh, that concentrating solar technologies um, can operate over the full range of typical process heat application temperatures. Um, so it's uh, technically at least well suited uh, for these applications. Um, and then I also show down below the graph sort of the um, temperature ranges over which you'd use different heat transfer fluids as, as the working fluid um, for a solar IPH system. 
Uh, I got this information from a, a useful document that uh, I wanted to mention as well as uh, written by NL for the Department of Energy, and it's a sort of a market analysis of, of solar industrial process heat, uh, the market in the US. Uh, it's as of 2015, so it's slightly out of date, but there's still a lot of very useful information, including descriptions of, of specific real systems and some high-level cost data um, and references to other sources of information. So a useful document if you're getting started with IPH or um, also useful reference for IPH and SAM to give a sense of the context of what types of systems it can model. Um, we've developed this new metric, the levelized cost of heat, um, which is analogous to the levelized cost of electricity on the CSP side. Um, and so it's a, it's a cost per unit of energy that captures both the quantity of energy produced by the system and the installation and operating costs um, of the system. So it's a useful metric for comparing uh, different projects or comparing uh, different technologies. Um, the LCOH is a metric that you can use to compare the cost of, produce, of, generate, of producing heat to, um, with solar energy to that of, from natural gas, for example. Um, the LCOH, LCOH calculator in SAM um, is different from the single owner financial model that you might be familiar with from the CSP models. That single owner model is a, uses a pro forma cash flow to calculate a levelized cost of energy. So it does sort of detailed year by year uh, calculation of operating costs and incentives and debt costs and so on uh, to come up with a levelized cost of energy. For this model, um, you provide a fixed charge rate as an input to the model, which kind of represents all of those co financial costs and benefits. Um, and, and then SAM calculates the annual energy and calculates the LCOH using this, this equation here. Um, the fixed charge rate method is also available for the LCOE on the CSP side of things. So you could use this method both for LCOE and LCOH in SAM. Um, there's more on this metric, uh, both in the document that I mentioned earlier uh, and in SAM's help system. All right, so the, uh, the two new IPH models in SAM were adapted from the CSP models for parabolic troughs and, and linear Fresnel. Um, so uh, this diagram shows very high level block diagram of the CSP models. You've got three overall components, the solar field that converts solar energy into thermal energy, the power cycle that co converts the thermal energy into electric energy, um, and then a storage system for the, that's available for the trough uh, model, which, which uh, is an optional component. Uh, that can store thermal energy. So before this current version of SAM, it was possible to model an uh, industrial process heat system by uh, carefully choosing values of input parameters for the power cycle that would essentially disable it or take it out of the, out of the model. And then you would just ignore the uh, electric output of the power cycle and look at the um, temperatures and pressures and so on of the HTF at the solar field outlet uh, and consider that to be input for your uh, process heat application. Um, so this technique is described in a document that I've shown at the bottom of the slide there which you can um, you can download from the SAM website and that this technique is you can still use it in the current version of SAM um, but with the a uh, creation of these industrial process heat models, we've we've kind of tweaked the inputs uh, for the trough and linear Fresnel models um, to make them more appropriate for the lower temperature um, applications of process heat. And then also because they're coupled with the, the uh, LCOH calculator, then you can do some economic analysis with these models that you couldn't really do uh, with the, the workaround and CSP models before. Um, so the 
uh, sort of an important distinction between the parabolic trough model and the linear direct steam model, aside from the systems that they represent, is that the parabolic trough model uses physical representations of, of the collector and receiver. Um, so you provide the model with a physical description of the collector, you know, it, the size and shape and, and optical properties, and, and, and uh, similarly for the receivers, you give it a set of thermal properties, and, and then it, it calculates um, the optical efficiency and heat losses and so on from the, um, from the collector assembly. Um, the linear direct steam model requires you to provide um, uh, optical efficiency data as input um, and heat loss uh, uh, regression coefficients, coefficients um, as input. So the, um, the linear direct steam model is, is, uh, requires you to do a little bit more work out of, outside of SAM to come up with the input parameters than the parabolic trough model. Um, so if you're just getting started uh, with industrial process heat modeling or, or design, uh, you may want to start with the trough model. Um, it's a little bit easier to work with. Um, the direct steam model is maybe uh, more of a kind of oriented toward researchers who have access to more data about um, describing the components. We'll, and we'll see that when we look at the, the models in the user interface. Um, so with that, I will uh, jump into SAM and show you what these models look like. So let me get um, <clears throat> organized here. So we'll start SAM. And just in case you're not familiar with SAM, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through the steps of creating a new project. So we, this is the welcome uh, win window in SAM. We'll click Start a New Project. And we're presented with this list of performance models. And way down at the bottom are the two process heat models. Uh, so I'll click Process Heat Parabolic Trough to start with IPH Trough. And then it shows us two options for the financial model. We can either model the system without a financial model. So if we're not interested in looking at the levelized cost of heat, uh, you can just click No Financial Model. Um, but I'll, I want to show you the, that financial model. So I click LCOH Calculator, and then OK to create the new project uh, with a case in it. So this, there's a tab up here for the, the case is untitled at the moment. Uh, I can name it um, IPH uh, Trough. Uh, you can confirm that the, the performance model and financial model are the ones that you chose up here. Um, and then along the left side of the window here, we have the navigation menu, which has a set of buttons or tabs where you can go through the input pages. So as you click a different button here, it shows a different set of input parameters. And each input page is populated with default values. Um, so this means that you can start right off the bat. You create a, a, a case, and you can just you can click Simulate to run a simulation and get some results right away. Um, so you can get kind of familiarize your, yourself with the model before you start uh, coming up with your own inputs. Um, and so then on the results page, we see a summary uh, table with some key outputs. And then you can use the tabs or buttons along the top to navigate through uh, looking at different, uh, looking at the outputs in different formats. Um, so, <clears throat> and then you can go back to the input pages to sort of look at, at your inputs and compare them to your outputs. If you want to switch back and forth between inputs and results, use this button next to the simulate button. That switches you back over to the outputs without running a simulation. All right, so um, <clears throat> we'll start with the um, the location and resource page. And this is where um, you choose a weather file for your analysis. So when you run a simulation, SAM runs an hour by hour simulation uh, over one year. Um, and in order to do that, it needs hourly data describing the solar resource and the meteorological conditions 
at your project site. So the weather file contains that data. It's 8,760 rows of solar resource temperature, atmospheric pressure, and other data um, characterizing the solar resource at, at a, a given location. Um, and there are a few different ways you can get uh, weather data to use with SAM. Uh, uh, the best method is to download a weather file from the National Solar Radiation Database, which is a database maintained by NRA with a bunch of weather fi <coughs> files for locations in the US, uh, Central America, Northern South, South America, Canada, and parts of Asia as well. Um, so you just type a address here. I'm, we're working in Imperial, California, so I'll just um, put the city name there since I don't have a specific address. But you could enter a street address or latitude, longitude here. Click OK, and then uh, you're offered a choice of either a typical year data uh, file or a single year data file. I'm going to um, use a typical year data file here. And then um, Sam downloads the, the file from the uh, NSRDB and adds the file to the Solar Resource Library. Um, if you have weather data from some other source and you have a file that's in the SAM CSV format, uh, you can uh, use that as well. And the best way to work with those files is to create a folder on your computer to store your SAM weather files. And then click Folder Settings here and add that folder to the list of folders that SAM searches for weather data. When you do that, then um, SAM will automatically add your, your own custom weather files to the library here. And you can use them just like the, the built-in weather files. The next page here is the system design page. So if you're familiar with the um, CSP trough model, um, <clears throat> you'll notice that uh, we've kind of reorganized the inputs a little bit here um, to put them more in line with, with sort of a new, new user interface paradigm that we're moving toward, which is to put the, all of the design parameters in one place. So you don't have to flip between input pages to find your, your main design parameters that define the, the capacities of the different components of the system. So the system design page is where you um, uh, specify the design point DNI, which determines the size of the field, um, assuming summer solstice sun position. Um, and then a target solar multiple, which uh, really isn't uh, too applicable here yet. Um, you typically use a solar multiple for a system that has storage to size the solar field um, relative to the required load. Um, and uh, so for now, you could just set that to 1. Um, and when we add storage later on, then, then that will be more useful. Um, then the loop inlet and outlet temperatures, you want to make sure that those are within your um, heat transfer fluid operating ranges. And those operating ranges are on the solar field page. So if we go over to the solar field page, there's the heat transfer fluid properties are over here. And you can choose different HTFs. Uh, pressurized water is the default one. And you can see the minimum and maximum operating temperatures are, are here. And they're blue, meaning that they're not values that you can edit. Uh, these are properties that are stored in SAM's internal HTF library. Um, and they're basically guidelines uh, to um, help you choose uh, a reasonable range, operating uh, range for the, uh, the solar field inlet and outlet. Um, so you, you want to make sure that your inlet and outlet temperatures are within those ranges, which by default they are. Um, SAM won't prevent the model from exceeding the HTF limits. So it, it's possible uh, to design a system that will run at higher temperatures than this, these, the maximum temperature or lower temperatures. So you want to check your results, check the temperatures and the results to make sure they're not exceeding these values. Um, SAM doesn't do that for you. And then the heat sink power here is the capacity or the thermal load of the, 
of the system in, in thermal megawatts. So this represents the the load, the thermal load of, of your uh, process heat application. And there there are a couple of the, there are two ways to d specify the heat sink power. You can either type a number in here. Um, so I could make it seven, for example, to make it a little bit bigger. And then that adjusts the number of loops. You need more loops to for more for a higher heat sink power capacity. And obviously, uh, there's a increase in the aperture area associated with that. Um, or you can just uh, type in a number of loops if you if you want to design the system for a given number of loops. You just type a number in there, and then Sam calculates the heat sink power for you and populates it there and there. So now my number of loops is the number that I specified. Um, just a quick note here that if you cancel out of this window, you might expect the window just to disappear and do nothing, but instead it asks you a silly question. Um, and the correct answer to that silly question is no. So just click no to go back to the um, system design page. Um, so I made some changes. I want to make sure that I'm running the default system, so I'm going to reset my inputs to the default values before we go on. Um, another thing I'd like to point out here is that there's a constant loss of 4% by default. Um, so this is comes from the CSP models where by default we assume an uh, annual availability factor of 96%, um, which is reasonable for a big power generating system, but probably for a smaller industrial heat application it might not be that high. So you can edit that number change it to something. I'll change it maybe to one. It might be lower than that. Um, you can. There are also fancier ways to, to add uh, losses that you can read more about and help. Uh, but just to be aware that this default value is perhaps a little higher than uh, you would want it to be. Um, then on the solar field page, at the top of the page we have the system design parameters. So that this is a summary from the system design page, just showing the, the main design uh, values. You can't edit them here, but you can edit them on the system design page. Um, and these inputs are all the same as the CSP uh, physical trough model, um, except for these inputs about um, piping. Um, and we've got this is named model piping through heat sink, this checkbox. Um, this really is should say something like model piping between field and heat sink. So it's um, by default the number of field subsections here is one. Um, so if you're familiar with the CSP trough, you know that that the minimum number of subsections on the CSP side is two. But for IPH we allow one subsection, um, and so that'll that'll uh, include the first header. Um, so just enough piping to uh, get the heat from the so whole solar field to the application. So maybe your your industrial process heat uh, collectors might be on the roof of a building and then you have some piping going down into the building to deliver the heat to whatever process you're running. Um, if you want to model a longer length of pipe, then you can ch check this box and put the pipe length in here in meters. And so um, the piping length affects the heat loss and thermal inertia and capacity of the, the piping components and also affects the pumping power. Um, so these are this is the, the only difference between the CSP trough and IPH on the solar field input page. Um, a difference in, in the way the model works between the CSP trough and IPH trough is the uh, is defocusing, field defocusing. So the CSP trough system will defocus the field if the uh, thermal output of the field is above the design point. Um, whereas the IPH model does not do that. The only uh, the only time that the field will defocus collectors is if the uh, maximum flow weight is exceeded. So this this uh, this input here will determine when the field defocuses. Uh, 
um, on the collectors page, the collectors and receivers input page are the same as for the CSP model. <clears throat> and um, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, these are uh, inputs for a physical model of, of the component. So uh, we have a physical description of the, of the uh, collector here. And we've got some uh, built-in, we've got a library here with built-in collectors. So you can choose a collector from the library here. You click its name in the library, and then you click Apply Values from the Library uh, to take those the values from, from this table up here and, and populate them in the actual inputs. Um, and you can specify up to four different collector types. So if you've got a if your loops have different types of collectors, you can you can um, com you can combine different types of collectors in a, in a single loop. And you do that by expanding each type. And if you want to I don't know, make this an LS3 collector, then you just click the number up here and click Apply Values from Library. Um, if you have parameters for a collector that's not in the library, you can just type them in by hand. Okay, so let's reset that to default for our example here. And then receivers is similar. So you've got a library up here. You click, click a name in the library, click Apply Values from Library to populate these inputs. And you can you have up to uh, four different receiver types. Um, you also on the receiver uh, page have this variations. So you have four variations within each type. So this means that the field consists of 98.5% uh, of collectors, or sorry, the, of receivers that have the properties of, of variation one, which in this case represents a receiver that's in good condition. And variation two and variation three are for receivers that have some sort of damage. Um, so they, they, their efficiency is less than ideal. So you can model this would, for a large CSP system, you might have you know, thousands of receivers out in the field and some, and some small percentage of them may be damaged. So you can account for that in your analysis. So for your IPH system, if you wanted to model just one variation, all the, all the, the, the four collectors in the loop are in good condition, then you would change this number to 1 and these others to 0. Um, <clears throat> reset it back to defaults. And then if you do model a system with multiple types of receivers or collectors, uh, you go back to the solar field page and scroll to the very bottom. And we've got this cool little widget that allows you to specify the number of collector assemblies in the loop. Uh, which you do by typing a number in here. So we can have up to 32 collectors in the loop. Um, so blue represents the cold end of the loop and red is the hot end of the loop. And this really is just a straight line. The, the curves here are just to fit in the rectangle. They don't, they're not telling you anything about the physical layout of the collectors. That's sort of outside of the scope of SAM. Um, so we'll go back to our default of four. And then you, if you want to change the collector type, um, then you ch click Edit SCAs here, and let's make this SCA Type 2, Collector Type 2. So I click the collector, it turns blue, and then I type a number 2, and it changes the SCA type here to 2. So I could, if I wanted a different collector type on the uh, <clears throat> hot end of the loop than the cold end, then I could do that, and I could change the HCE type here. Maybe it's Type 3, and this is Type 2. Um, and then I can also edit the defocus order. So by default, the hot collector defocuses, defocuses first and then the cooler one. But I can change that order by clicking this option here and then selecting a collector and typing a number. Um, so just a quick tutorial on how to work with that widget. I'll set it back to the defaults. Okay, and then on the financial parameters page is where we um, <clears throat> provide the inputs for the LCOH calculator. And you'll see that it, some places here it says LCOE instead of LCOH. That's just, um, uh, just ignore the E. It should be an H. Um, so you, you basically need three inputs for the LCOH calculator. You need a capital cost, an 
annual operating cost, and a fixed charge rate. Um, so, and then the LCOH is the fixed is calculated using this equation, and the annual energy comes from the simulation results. So we have to run a simulation before we have the annual energy uh, and can calculate the LCOH. Um, if you don't have don't know the fixed charge rate, you can use this calculator to calculate the fixed charge rate based on these financial parameters that um, may be more re readily available for you. Um, so, but in any case, that this fixed charge rate that's displayed here is the number that goes into the model along with the um, capital cost and fixed operating cost. All right, make sure I didn't change anything. I want to run the default case. Um, so once I've gone through all the inputs, then I can run simulate, click simulate, and this is running a simulation, so it's running through each of the 8760 uh, rows of data in the weather file, calculating um, conditions at various points in the system, and then uh, adding up the, the uh, hourly output of the field and reporting that on the system summary page. <clears throat> so um, we can see here the annual energy is the, um, this is the energy that's uh, delivered to the IPH application, um, del de um, delivered to the load, and then the field energy is the output of the field, and those are the same in this case because we don't have any freeze protection, so all of the energy produced by the field gets delivered to the load. Um, and we can see that on an hourly basis uh, on the time series graph. Um, if I plot this oddly named output called, um, so heat sink thermal power, that's the power delivered to the application. Um, and then um, field thermal power leaving in HTF. That is the, the thermal energy from the field. Uh, and because we don't have any storage uh, or freeze protection, these two are the same. Um, I will note that if you look very carefully, you'll see some uh, slight discrepancies uh, at the beginning and end of the day. And those just have to do with some uh, little quirks in the internal calculations that we're going to fix uh, in the next uh, update. Um, uh, they're just small changes, so they're not very significant, but, but uh, these two should be the same. <clears throat> and then we can also look at other property. We can look at temperatures and, and other properties uh, of the system on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. Um, we can look at this heat map, which gives you a uh, snapshot of the um, the various parameters. So here's the receiver mass flow rate for the entire year. Um, the statistics tab shows you these statistical summaries of the, all of those outputs, which can be ha handy if you want to quickly see what the maximum value of a, of a parameter is, for example. Um, so the, all of these different tabs show you uh, the same data in different formats. Um, so uh, we can play around a little bit with the inputs to see how the model works. Um, for, 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 for example, um, <clears throat> we could change the heat transfer fluid. So uh, for the default case, uh, we're using pressurized water as the HTF. Um, but we could change it to, uh, to an oil, say, let's say, Thermal VP1. Um, and that changes the, the, the HTF properties, including these operating temperatures. So we need to go back to the system design page and probably increase this maximum temperature. Uh, and then just for fun, we could um, add some freeze protection. We can increase the freeze protection temperature to require that, that uh, the system provide, that we use some of our energy to maintain the uh, temperature of the, um, of the fluid. Uh, so I'll just change it to 220. Uh, and then if I run a simulation now, I'll see a difference between the energy delivered by the field uh, and the ener energy 
uh, delivered to the, uh, sorry, the energy produced by the field and the energy delivered to the load. Um, and that'll also um, affect the pumping power and the um, <clears throat> and heat losses, the, the, the change in HTF, because the HTF has different thermal properties um, and viscosity. Um, so let's see. Oops. So we can look at the pumping power here um, and freeze protection energy required. Um, so uh, <coughs> All right, uh, I think that's all I wanted to mention for the trough model. Um, let's uh, have a quick look at the linear Fresnel model, the, the linear direct steam model. Um, so we can use uh, ta uh, cases in SAM to compare different analysis scenar scenarios. So I could create another file for my uh, direct steam example, but I'm going to add a case. So I click add and <clears throat> choose the direct linear steam model and the LCOH calculator. And uh, that creates another case. So it's a tab sort of analogous to a worksheet in an Excel workbook. Um, and I'll rename that to IPH direct steam. Um, and we have the same buttons for the inputs. The weather, the location and resource page is the same for all of the solar models. Uh, the system design page is similar to the IPH trough system design page. Um, but now we have an input for the field outlet steam quality. Um, so the, the uh, steam quality at the outlet of the field is, is two phase um, at the quality that you specify there. Um, and uh, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, so the direct steam model requires a knowledge of the uh, of certain parameters that that are modeled by the trough model, and one of those is the pressure drops um, uh, for different sizes of loops. So if you change the the number of collectors in the loop, if you change the loop size, you also have to change the pressure drops accordingly. It doesn't do that automatically. Um, and also, the, the direct steam model doesn't have uh, flow rate limits. So you have to manage those on your own uh, by looking at the flow rates and the results. Um, <clears throat> again, we've got this 4% constant loss. It's probably a little high for IPH application. Um, so the, the solar field here consists of a single boiler section. There's no superheater, as there is in a linear Fresnel system for power generation. Um, and you set the number of um, boiler modules here to determine the uh, loop aperture area. So if I change the number of modules in the boiler section, that changes the aperture area. Oops, I'll change it back to the 6. Um, and then this design ambient temperature, that's used in uh, the heat loss uh, po polynomial polynomials in the model to calculate the thermal efficiency um, at design. So this is another design parameter. Um, oh, and I guess I should mention also on the solar field page that the, just reiterate that the pressure drops are not modeled physically. So you need to make adjustments to these um, if you adjust the number of modules in the boiler section. On the collector and receiver page, um, so here, here's that table of uh, um, optical efficiency values that I mentioned before. Um, so on the trough side, we have this nice library, and, and these all look like numbers that we recognize, just m measurements of dimensions and, and uh, optical efficient or loss uh, factors. Um, but on the for this, 
direct steam model, we have to provide this table of uh, optical efficiencies. Um, or um, you can, if you've got a, a set of coefficients for, for uh, IAM, um, for incident, incident angle modifier uh, polynomials, you can provide those here. You just change the option here and provide the coefficients. So this requires that you get this data from somewhere. Um, you can either find it in a, in a research paper um, or perhaps you've generated them yourself um, somewhere outside of SAM. Um, and then for the, the receiver, uh, you can either use this polynomial heat loss model, so you have to provide a set of coefficients, of, um, or um, if you're modeling an evacuated tube receiver, then you can use the physical model uh, as we saw in the, on the trough side, um, but you have to enter the parameters here by hand. We don't have a library hooked up here. Um, so if you wanted to model one of these receivers, um, you could copy the inputs over, I guess, um, into these uh, values. And then on the solar field page, we just recently discovered uh, a bug in the actual number of loops here. Uh, there's a, the, the, the equation is accidentally rounding down instead of up. Um, this is an equation in the user interface, not in the underlying model. Um, but it does mean that uh, um, you're going to end up modeling a system with one fewer loop than is indicated there. So that's going to be significant for a process heat application that, does, that just has a few uh, loops. And uh, um, so we'll, we need to fix that. And we are going to do that in the next update, which we're planning to re uh, release at the end of this month, so in a couple of weeks. Then the financial parameters are the same as for the uh, IPH trough model. And you click Simulate to get results. Um, and uh, I won't go into too much more than that on the direct steam model because I want to leave time for, for questions. Um, so with that, I think I will <clears throat> see if, uh, what's been going on while I've been talking. Uh, it looks like we have one question. So if you have a question, um, we can, you can feel free to use the little hand raising icon there uh, to raise your hand and uh, I, I can unmute you if you'd like to add, ask a question by voice. Um, otherwise, I'll just look at the uh, for questions that you may have typed here. So I see here one from Mark um, on the finance page. How is the PFF calculated? Seems like a holdover from electricity-based model. I recall that the PFF factored in depreciation assumptions. Um, so yeah, these, uh, if you if you use this calculator to calculate your fixed charge rate, uh, the equations that um, Sam is using to calculate, so if you, if you use the calculator, then you provide these financial parameters. And, and then based on these inputs, Sam calculates a capital recovery factor, factor a project financing factor, and a construction financing factor. and um, these are then used to calculate the FCR using these e numbers. Um, so, and yes, this is based, well, this is based on a method that was developed for NREL's annual baseline technology study. I think that's what, or ATB, annual technology baseline. Uh, and so it's, it's sort of a, that generic system. If there are, if you want to leave depreciation out or some other, element out, then you just have to zero that out of, you know, don't include depreciation in here. Um, and then it, depreciation won't, won't get be accounted for. Um, the default values here, I think, are just from the, uh, I don't know where these numbers come from, but they're for a power generation project for sure. Um, so obviously, if you're going to use this uh, LCOH calculator, you need to go through the inputs and make sure they actually make sense for your analysis. Um, you may just calculate your own fixed charge rate and provide it here. Um, any
any other questions or any comments from Ty or my other colleagues? Hey, Paul. Yeah, hey, Ty. Um, I'll just point out that in the physical trough model, you showed how to set the defocus order. Yeah. So currently, we're defocusing all of the assemblies simultaneously. So we still allow you to set that in the interface, but it doesn't actually do anything. Um, so we need to decide whether we want to bring that feature back or remove the input from the UI, but right, right now that doesn't matter. Okay. Thank you for uh, pointing that out, Ty. So <clears throat> the defocus order in this widget doesn't really affect anything. And I guess that's another thing to mention is these are brand new models in SAM, um, and we, uh, we're, we're working on them, uh, finding bugs and fixing them, and, and uh, uh, eager to hear any feedback that you might have on on enhancements or or tweaks to to the model. So um, for now, the as Ty mentioned, the all of the collectors defocus uh, simultaneously for the IPH trough model. Um, okay, here's another question about uh, modeling a receiver without a glass envelope, a non-evacuated receiver. Do you have any tips on that, Ty? Uh, yep, so if we look at the receiver page, Um, you can essentially specify broken glass there. So it's, you'd rather not call it broken glass, I guess, if you intend not to have it, but that's the way to model it with the evacuated tube model. So I guess it's no longer an evacuated tube. So the, just a tube model with, with no glass, you can just select that box. And then you might want to consider changing your um, absorber Absorptance and emittance properties, um, as those tend to deteriorate when exposed to the air. And I think the defaults kind of highlight how those could change if you look at the different variations, so the broken glass variation, for example. Yeah, so variation three here is a broken glass default. We have a few few minutes left, so if there are any other questions, we'd love to hear them. Paul, one other thing that I... Um, a member of the audience pointed out is that the the defaults for the receiver page um, somehow they don't perfectly track the shot library. So if you hit apply library values up here, um, you'll actually see that a few small things have changed. So I'm not sure how that was saved incorrectly, but I mean notice the annulus gas changed to hydrogen for the near vacuum case. And then the absorber admittance changed from a value to a table for variation three. And that, that lines up better with um, the actual library values. So we'll need to update the default in the patch that's coming out as well. OK, so, so that means if you're running the trough model here, you might want to just reapply the values from the library um, to make sure that the latest versions are, are in here. Um, and another thing uh, that I, I meant to mention um, here on the financial page, there's another, there's a, a parameter, uh, the levelized cost of heat uh, section up here. 
is the electricity rate. So this is to account for the um, electricity uh, required for pumping uh, power. Um, so that gets uh, rolled into the um, operating cost in the calculation of the LCOH in the results. Kind of hiding up at the top of the page here. All right, well, we'll wait another minute or so, see if, if uh, anyone else has a question. And, and if not, then we'll um, go ahead and sign up. Oh, we got one here. Um, I might have missed this as I came to the webinar late, but does the model incorporate some sort of thermal losses model or provide the user with the ability to design for that? So, <clears throat> Yeah, the, the model, both the trough, IPH trough and the IPH direct steam models calculate heat losses based on the parameters that you specify for the, the heat, uh, sorry, for the receiver. Um, <clears throat> and for the direct steam model, you can either use this polynomial uh, method or the physical model for an evacuated tube. And uh, you'll see the design heat loss values here, but then in the results you'll see um, the receiver thermal losses are reported. Um, it, the, those, these are the ones calculated during this, the simulation. So the short answer is, is yes. Um, the model does, does uh, account for the thermal losses. Right. Any other questions? All right. Then I think we'll uh, go ahead and sign off. Um, just another reminder that, that tomorrow at this same time, uh, Mike Wagner will be giving a presentation on the molten salt power tower model, and he'll walk through a demonstration uh, showing the um, solar field optimization and dispatch optimization uh, improvements. Um, and you can register for that uh, webinar along with um, the other SAM webinars on the SAM website on the webinars page. Um, and if you've got any other questions, um, we uh, would love to hear from you. You can contact us uh, either on the support forum um, or by email. Uh, there's also a contact form on the on the SAM website that you can use to, to email us um, direct, directly. And uh, and in the next couple of days, we'll be posting a recording of this video along with the, the slides that I used. Um, and this uh, SAM file that I uh, demonstrated. Um, so with that, uh, go ahead and sign off. And uh, thank you all for part participating and look forward to hearing from you soon. Goodbye.